weeks ago, we dealt with, I actually, it was last week, we dealt with uh, what we're calling uh, Why People Matter. And uh, it's a little series that I really feel we need to go through. Um, <clears throat> we are in a uh, transition. We are in a cultural battle. We are struggling to es- establish specific, strong culture in our church, and that culture surrounds relationships. Uh, We are focused on discipleship and Bible studies and investing in people, and uh, the more we can educate ourselves, the more we can prepare ourselves for the future, the revival that's coming, the influx of souls, the better off we are. The more people we can get on board and uh, get you at a level of uh, relational skills that uh, you can teach Bible studies and develop people, this is what we're after. So last week we dealt with the big picture principle. We just talked about the importance of people and the value of people. Tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to move on with that, and we're going to look at a few relationship rules. I'm looking at Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24. The Bible says, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother, and of course we know who that is. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. Um, I think that in this day and hour, we need the value of relationships more than we've ever needed them before. If you were to do a phone survey and you go ask a bunch of CEOs of top-level corporations, and you ask them, what is the most important thing in your organization? The vast majority of those CEOs are going to tell you that it is the ability of our people, our employees, our associates to work with people. Really, that is where uh, the bottom line is, how we treat people and how we are able to interact with people and work with people. Ask any entrepreneur, ask any business owner in the area what is the most important thing that their business success or failure hinges on, and they will tell you that what our success is beholden to is our ability to interact and relate to people. The skills that we have in working with people is what uh, attributes the bulk of our success as a business. They will tell you that. Ask any salesperson that's successful. They're out there beating the bushes and it doesn't matter what they sell. They can sell whatever it is they're told to sell. These sales people, they will tell you that above and beyond everything else, it is people skills that will always supersede product knowledge. To a successful salesman, it doesn't matter what you ask him or her to sell. If they have the people skills, they can sell it. It doesn't matter what the product is. They will tell you that up front. We need to remember, life is not about houses and cars, retirement accounts, uh, toys. Life is about relationships. And I know we all know that, but sometimes we don't act like that. Sometimes we act like people are a problem. Or people are a bother. And the truth of the matter is, no one ever truly succeeds on their own. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter how footloose and independent you think you might be. If you are successful at what you are doing, there is an element 
of uh, interacting with other people that are making you successful. Those who encourage you, those who promote you, those who back you, those who believe in you, those who support you, those who give you advice, those people have contributed to your success as an individual. Now, that having been said, uh, likewise, when you flip the coin, most of life's failures, we're talking about people making mistakes. We're talking about people messing up. We're talking about people with poor choices. Most of life's failures on our part are linked back to people in our lives who adversely affected us. Think about it. You know, we have people coming into our church, being born again, settling on our pews, building friendships among us. And when you hear their story, where they come from and what they came out of, sometimes you just shake your head in bewilderment at how they even survive. We start talking about being bound to an abusive spouse. We talk about uh, being part of a codependent family. Uh, you start talking about an irresponsible friend who leaves you hanging out to dry. Talking about an unreliable business partner. You know, these people who come into your life and, and they contributed to failures in your life. Either way you look at it, we do not live our lives without the influence, good or bad, of people. More than we would like to admit it, basically, life's successes or failures are traced back to relationships. And if you're honest with yourself, you would have to admit that. You can be talented, you can be beautiful, you can be smart, you can be creative, you can be motivated to succeed and still not accomplish near in life what you are capable of doing if you cannot win and maintain positive, healthy relationships. We do need each other. Like that old proverb, you know, you're walking down the path and you see a turtle sitting on a fence. You can know that he did not get there by himself. Somebody helped get him there. You cannot make it without the influence and the help of the right people. And this is what we're talking about tonight. Um, you cannot make people like you, as bad as you want to. Doesn't you, Some of your personality is so bubbly, everybody in the world must just love you to death. And the truth of the matter is, mm -mm, it doesn't work quite that way. Sometimes they don't like you because you're too bubbly. You're too social, you know. You can't make people like you. But you can become the type of person that others would want to spend time with and would want to build a relationship with. If you can learn those secrets, if you can get that inroad, if you can discover those principles, you can work on you changing you, becoming a better person that is going to attract other people. You know, now, when it comes to relational skills, I'm not here up here tonight because, uh, you know, I've got an A-plus in this subject and I passed the exam. I'm still working on my relationship skills. I have days where, you know, I'm bubbly and I'm, I'm optimistic and I'm feeling good about life and I'm friendly and I'm nice and I'm cooperative and then... To be honest, there are other days I'm in the mully grubs and I'm ignoring people and, and, uh, and not paying attention to the relationships that I enter into during the day. So in other words, I'm still working on this too and I've got plenty of room to improve. Relational skills do not come to most of us naturally. It just doesn't happen. We have to work at it. We have to learn how to do it. We have to educate it, 
educate ourselves. You know, when you think about it, many of us, admittedly, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, we came from dysfunctional homes. You know, when you think about it, you know, and if we're honest, we had examples, peers, uh, we had role models who weren't exactly the type of people that need to be paraded in front of you showing you how to win friends and influence people. You know, uh, many of us have struggled. Um, some of us have never had those positive relational uh, skills modeled for us. Those people who led us in the right direction. And so we have to remember that we are a work in progress. Or in other words, I don't know about you, I need all of the information, all of the education I can get uh, so that I can be a better, what we would call, people person. I want to do that, okay? Now, who you are uh, is pretty much summed up by how you see your world. We want to talk about this for a few minutes here tonight. We want to talk about a couple relationship rules. Uh, number one, who you are determines what you will generally see in others. Who you are will determine how you look at other people. Who you are pretty much determines how you see your world. You know, you talk about putting on those rose-colored glasses and we, we see through that influence. That is true when it comes to relationships. Some people call this the law of mirroring. In other words, what we often see in other people, right? Our first impressions, negative or positive, actually is a result of what we don't want to admit about ourselves. Or in other words, sometimes we look at other people and our first impression being negative. They're a complainer. They're a whiner. And sometimes that mirror that mirror principle is in effect here. Uh, what's really going on is that you see quickly the errors, the weaknesses in their character that are also in yours too, you know? Show me someone who typically sees him or herself in a negative light, and I will show you someone who sees the whole world in a negative light. They can't help themselves. If they are negative about themselves they are going to be negative about the people around them, okay? It is impossible for us to behave in a manner that is inconsistent with how we see ourselves. In other words, who you are on the inside is going to work its way out. You can come here on Sunday and you can clap your hands and comb your hair just right, shine your shoes and talk the talk and walk the walk on Sunday. But sooner or later, we behave how we feel about ourselves on the inside. And that is true. You know, it would be kind of like a uh, you got a counseling session going on and the wife is complaining about her husband. You know, she's going drone and on and on and on about his attitude, about his hostility, about his unresolved anger. You know, and the longer she talks, the madder she gets. And then when the counselor stops her in mid-stride and asks her about her anger and her hostility, you know, her response to that is she's saying, Hey, I'm not the one who's angry. I'm not the one who's hostile. He is. You know, they just don't see it. And that's typically how it is with us. Sometimes we do not see ourselves. You know, Matthew chapter 7 verse 3 says this. Why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye. And when you can't see past the log in your own eye. And then, of course, um, the scripture pins it very clearly. Hypocrite. First, get rid of the log in your own eye. And then you'll see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. 
Now, now I'm, I'm not here, I'm not uh, poking and gouging here. I'm just trying to help us understand we are a product of our past and we need to understand how we truly see life and see our world because it's going to affect how we interact with other people. Sometimes, you know, the, sometimes we are, we are guilty of doing the same things that, that we complain about in other people. It'd be like complaining about your wife or your husband's complaining, you know. We're doing it what we're saying they're doing, you know. And it's just life and it's human nature. And we got to understand that. It takes transparency. It takes honesty on our part to see these deficiencies and to be willing to own up to them and admit them in prayer. Sometimes we criticize and condemn and judge other people for the same issues that we've got going on on us, in us. We don't see us, we see them. And the truth of the matter is, they're mirroring what we are. And so we have to be man enough, woman enough, mature enough to go to God in prayer and address these issues with God. Talking to God, God, change me, you know, and this is what's important. What we think about others is filtered through how we see ourselves. If I don't have a good self-image, it is going to affect how I see everybody around me. We'll talk about that in just a moment. You know, we're going to see other people through the lens of our past experiences, our opinions, our attitudes, whether they're right or wrong, good or bad. This is how we view our world. But sometimes we don't get it right. We got a piece of it, we got a portion of it, but we don't have all of it. And we certainly don't see ourselves in the mirror. Um, Let me give you an example. Anybody remember the fable of the blind men and the elephant? Do you remember that that, uh, textbook child story, a fable? You know, got these blind men. And uh, they were trying to figure out what is an elephant. What does an elephant look like? Uh, One of the blind men had grabbed hold of the elephant's knee and said, Oh, I've got the idea here. I know for a fact now that the elephant looks like a tree. You know, and another one touched the elephant's tail and decided an elephant looks like a rope. Another one touched the elephant's ear and decided that an elephant looks like a big fan. Uh, Another one touched the elephant's trunk and said, I know what an elephant looks like. An elephant looks like a snake. And then, of course, one touched the elephant's sharp tusk and said, no, you're all wrong. An elephant looks like a spear. And the truth of the matter is they were all wrong because we can't see the big picture. If we're not careful, this is the way it can be when it comes to relationships. If we are sour on ourselves, if we are negative about ourselves, if we feel deficiency and shame and lack of progress in ourselves, it is going to bleed through in how we see the rest of our world, okay? Um, Give you another example here. This is an example that I use in Edge. Some of you have heard it. You know, a traveler, he's nearing this great city in the distance. He can see it. There's this old man sitting on the side of the trail here. And so he stopped and he asked the old man, he said, do you belong to the city up the road here? And he said, I do. And the the man who had never visited the city, he asked the old man, so what are the people like in the city there? And then the old man wisely Asks the traveler, well, what were the people like where you came from? Oh, you don't want to hear it. You know, I I don't have an hour here to tell you how horrible those people were back there. They're untrustworthy. They're uh, detestable. They're mean, mean people from where I came. And then the wise man sitting on the side of the road, he said, well, I, I got bad news for you. The people here in the city are just like that. You know, and then it wasn't too long ago, another uh, man came along and asked the same question. Hey, I'm headed for the city up there. You live in the city? Yeah. Uh, What are the people like in the city up there uh, down the road? And the old man again asked, well, what were the people like where you came from? He said, oh, I hated to leave. They were 
fine, honest people. They were industrious. They were generous to a fault, kind people. And the old man responded. He said, that's exactly the kind of people you're going to find there. So it's what we're looking for. It's what we're focused on. It's what we're thinking about. If I'm a trusting person, I'm going to see other people as trustworthy until they show me otherwise. I tend to be a trusting person. And I'll give you the benefit of the doubt until you cross me or you lie to me. And, and then it, it's, it's going to be a different story. I'm pretty trustworthy. And I tend to trust people uh, that, I, that I meet. If I'm a critical person, I'm typically going to see other people around me that I interact with. I'm going to see them with a critical eye. If I'm a caring person, I'm going to see other people as compassionate, kind, caring people. We just kind of mirror that. So whoever we are on the inside of us is how we tend to see our world around us. And this is why we've got to understand that and get that down and deal with that. We've got to have discussions with God about that. Okay. The second thing that is what we would call a relationship rule is who you are determines how you view life in general. How you view life in general. I've told this story before in Edge, and it's just very uh, applicable. It's about Grandpa. He's sleeping on the couch there in the living room, and the grandkids, they uh, sneak in the kitchen and get some Lindberger cheese out of the refrigerator, and they sneak up on Grandpa, who's snoozing on the couch, and they put a little dab of Lindberger cheese under his, on, under his nose on his mustache. Well... You know, it's not long Grandpa's starting to stir and starting to twitch. Well, in a few minutes, Grandpa sits up, bolt upright, and he said with a sour look on his face, he said, there's something that stinks in here. And so he couldn't sleep, so he got up and he went into the kitchen where Grandma's cooking uh, or baking cookies. And he takes in a deep breath, and he said, oh, Lord, it stinks in here also. And then he went on out to the back porch, opened the door, went down the steps, stepped out in the yard, took a big breath, and, and then all of a sudden he said, my God, the whole world stinks. And that is the way a lot of people are. The whole world stinks to them. You know, how you see life is going to affect how you feel about yourself and how you're going to feel about other people. You know, with Lindberger cheese up your nose, yeah, everything is going to stink. You know, the problem is, is we got to fix us. We got to change us. And that is something, cooperative effort between us and God that can happen. We can be friendly or unsociable. It's a choice. We can be suspicious or trusting. It's a choice. We can be optimistic or pessimistic. It's a choice. We can be cheerful or gloomy. It's a choice. We could be timid or brave. Again, it is a choice. Life is a choice. And we have to decide what kind of person do I want to be? What kind of person do I want to be in reference to those that I contact? The people, the peers, uh, the family, the friends that I know. You know, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt said, No one can make you feel inferior without your permission. And that's a great quote. Um, you know, if you don't respect yourself... You're going to have a hard time respecting others. Um, let's talk about real quickly here. Let's talk about five things that determine who we are. We're not trying to fix everybody else in this session. We're trying to help us. Is that okay? Before we can go out there and uh, develop deeper relationships and have more influence with people, we got to make sure we're on solid ground. We got to make sure we've got our ducks in a row. And that's what this session is about. Okay. Five things that help you determine 
who you are, what you are and who you are. Number one is genetics. You know, you can't change your DNA, and no one's asking you to. Uh, Your upbringing, your character, your education, uh, your spiritual and mental uh, development, all of that plays a role that helps develop and determine who you are, who you see yourself as, okay? Admittedly, as to personality, some of that is hardwired into our genes. You know, I am not a social butterfly. You know, uh, God didn't make me that way. And so I'm not trying to be a, a Fred Deuce. I'm not trying to be a, a Bianca Baptiste. You know, I am not a social, uh, I'm not a social butterfly. You know, I have to kind of grow on people and people grow on me. And I get that from my genes. You know, what's funny and I don't have a lot of time here, but uh, up in Wisconsin, you know, Joe and Amber are raising those three girls. And uh, Ava, she's 17. We're so proud of her. She started her first job. She's doing great. She is an extreme choleric, just like her father. You know, it's my way or the highway. You know, she will argue with you till the till the cows come home, you know, to, to have it her way. And then the youngest one, you know, She is also choleric. She's very, very intelligent, persuasive, manipulative. You know, she's good at it, right? And then squeeze right in the middle between those two extreme cholerics is little Audrey. And she's the little homemaker. And uh, she's the one that uh, has the phlegmatic personality. And uh, she just wants there to be peace in the house. And she'll give you, she'll give those girls whatever they want for them to like her and accept her and there be peace uh, in the house. And, you know, that, that doesn't quite seem fair to me, you know, but that is life. That's what we call Genetics, you got your four basic personalities. We teach it in EDGE. Some of this stuff is hardwired into our genes. When it comes to our character, we need to focus on our weaknesses, the areas where we know we need to shore some things up, do some things different. We need to have discussions with God. We need to give these areas over to God, read material, uh, work on those weaknesses, and do better improve them when it comes to our talents when it comes to our gifts either you got it or you don't right you got those gifts those talents those abilities you pick up a pen and you can draw a beautiful tree or the face of a friend you know that is a gift from God what you need to do with those you need to focus on those strengths and perfect them and develop them but where you see the weaknesses the flaws We don't need to just ignore them. We need to improve on them. We need to work on them. So a lot of that is genetics. Number two, a lot of it is self-image. You know, a person with a negative self-image ends up always expecting the worst. You know, you've heard the proverbial person, you hold up a glass of water, you know, it's, it's half full for some people. And then, of course, for some people, it's half empty. You know, they can't help but see the negative side of life. There are a lot of people out there because they are negative. They have a poor self-image that sabotages their relationships with other people. They tend to also gravitate toward like-minded people. You know, you, you, you've, you, 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 you've heard where, you know... Uh, People tend to gravitate toward how um, uh, uh, they themselves think. And that is a true statement. We find people that we're comfortable with. We find people who speak our lingo. We find, we find and we hang out with people who, who say what we think, what we feel. 
And if we're, we have a negative self-image about ourselves, we're going to find other people who have a poor self-image also. People with healthy self-images are people who are those who are expecting good things to happen. They're optimistic. They're above board. They're looking for the sun to come out. They're looking for the bills to be paid. They're looking to be successful. Why is that? Some of that is just because of their self-image. And again, they tend to gravitate toward like-minded people. Okay. Oliver Wendell Holmes, to give you an example here, he's walking down the street one day, famous jurist uh, out of the um, uh, early 1800s here in America. Uh, this little girl, she started walking in step with him, and they're going up and down the sidewalk, and they keep looking at each other, and she's just keeping up with him. He's walking. When the little girl started to turn back toward home, the famous jurist, Oliver Wendell Holmes, he told the little girl, he cleared his throat, and he said, when your mother asks you where you have been, you tell your mama that you have been walking with Oliver Wendell Holmes. You know, and she took that in and she said, okay. And the girl said, when you get to your house and your folks ask you where you've been, you tell them that you have been walking with Mary Susanna Brown. You know, that's what you call optimism there. I could use a little dose of that. You know, there is nothing wrong with having a positive self-image. People who like themselves. Yeah, there are some of them that are out there. They actually like themselves. And there's nothing wrong with that. A lot of it has to do with just simply being grateful rather than choosing to be hateful. It's a choice. Matthew chapter 22 verse 37 says, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. We get that. This is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like unto itself or unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Did you hear that? Jesus commands us to love our neighbor like we love ourselves. But what if you don't love yourself? What if you don't like yourself? What if you don't like keeping your own company? What if you don't like who you are and what you are and how you think? You're going to have a hard time relating to other people. Jesus said we are to love our neighbor like we would love ourselves. I think Jesus understood. If I am going to be able to love my neighbor, that means I first have to learn how to love myself. Okay? Now, to be clear, I'm not talking about this selfish, self-serving, narcissistic type of self-absorption. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about a healthy love for yourself. In other words, an appreciative insight as to how much God has done for you and to be grateful and, uh, and thankful for that. Um, we need to see ourselves as highly blessed and favored of God. And if we see ourselves in a positive light, then we are going to then and then only be able to see others in a positive light. Make sense? You know, how about the Good Samaritan? The Good Samaritan... Um, you know, he's, uh, what is he doing? He's taking care of a man who's half dead, who was robbed, left to die on the side of the road. The good Samaritan, he was a Samaritan. He wasn't a Jew. This man was accustomed to being ostracized, ridiculed, ignored by the Jewish people. Uh, this man was used to being despised. Uh, mistreated. This man knew what it felt like to be overlooked and passed over. And he sees this man on the side of the road. This man's a Jew, but he can relate to that person because he knows how it feels to be um, proverbially laying in the road and being ignored, stepped over, forget, forgotten, 
and left to die. He can, he can relate to that. And so because he can relate to that person's uh, a plight and situation, he has empathy for them. And so what, what, what he does is he uh, bathes his wounds, bandages him up, puts him on his donkey, takes him into town, and puts him up in, in a motel for a night or two. Um, he was able to relate, and this is what we need to work on. We need to be able to relate to people. So self-image, self, how you see yourself is going to determine how you see others. Quickly, life's experiences. Life's experiences. You know, if you grew up popular in school, everybody's hanging on your word, you know. If uh, you made it into the yearbook, on the front or back page, and you know, and if uh, you were the cat's meow as to popularity in school, you know, that tends to carry through in life. But what if you were on the other end of that? What if, you know, there's them and then there's us, you know? And, uh, you know, you don't, you don't make uh, most likely to succeed. You know, if you were neglected, if you were abused, if you were abandoned when you were young, you're going to tend to be distrusting of people. You know, how you were raised, you know, you can't do one thing about. But one thing you can do, you can make better choices now. You know, the great thing about choices now is that you're no longer a kid. You're no longer a child. Uh, you're now an adult, and, and you get to vote and you get to choose. You get to choose who you're going to marry. You get to choose the job you're going to uh, give a third of your life to. You get to choose the level of education that you're going to acquire. You get to choose who's going to be your friends, you know. So you can't go back and undo the past, but we can reprogram ourselves for the future. And then finally, there's attitude, attitude, attitude. Attitude is probably the most important trait here. We're talking about uh, things that determine who we are. Attitude, as much as anything. You know, you're limited when it comes to your DNA. You're limited when it comes to how you developed your own self-image as a child and as a teen. Uh, life experiences, the things that's happened to you, how life has been good to you or bad to you. There's none of that you can, you can change. You have very little control over that. But something you have total, complete control over is your attitude. And, uh, you know, you can't change, you can't change the world, but you can change how you see the world. You can, um, you can change how you view life. You can't change people, you can't change the world, but you can change how you see yourself, okay? Uh, let's stand to our feet. One of the most important things you'll ever do is choose your friends. Everybody said friends. The closest people to you right now will help shape your attitude and also help shape your destiny. Who are your friends? Who do you hang out with? Who do you allow to influence you? for the good or the bad. It's been said, and I think there's a lot of truth to that, the difference between who you are right now and who you will be five years from now pretty much is a decision you make as to who you spend your time with, friends, the books you read, and the media you watch. Five years from now, that's who you will be based on the decisions, the choices that you are making right now. If you don't like people, I don't like people. Do you understand? That's really more of a statement about you than it is about them. Because, you know, we've been eating sour grapes. You know, we're looking through rose-colored glasses. We're not seeing the world as it really is. We, we're seeing a skewed view. So if you don't like people, it's more of a statement about you than it is them. You know, your viewpoint can be the problem, the issue, the blockage. And this is what we've got to talk to God about. 
if there are things about your character, if there are things about your personality, if there are things about you that you've noticed that's negative or sour or vindictive or uh, um, unforgiving, you know, any character traits that you see in you. I've got a question for you. Do you pray about those issues? Do you talk to God about those weaknesses in your life? God, I don't want to be this way. I understand. I see that I could be more kind, compassionate, loving, understanding, you know, or, or whatever it is. And just those conversations with God, admitting, confessing, and reconciling. You'd be surprised how much God will use people and God will use your relationship with him to change you and to develop your character and uh, build you into a better person. Why don't we do this? Why don't we close our eyes? Let's pray. Let's ask God to absorb this material. I know that this is not super spiritual material, but uh, this can and would help us when it comes to building relationships with people. Let's pray. God, right now, in the name of Jesus, I want to thank you for this beautiful group of people. God, I thank you for their character. I thank you for their relationship with you. God, I want to thank you for their friendship. God, I thank you, Lord, that we're part of a bigger body. And God, I'm thankful for each one of them. God, we all have our issues. We all have our weak areas. We all.